Thanks. Um, so I'm presenting this paper uh, on behalf of myself, my supervisor, Frank Vitari, who's in the audience, and my co-supervisor, Shantan Chang. So the human body has emerged as more than just a, a canvas for wearable devices. Technological size and cost reductions, as well as battery um, and power improvements, has meant that items that were once external have become wearable or even insertable. We use the term insertable to refer to non-permanent voluntary devices contained within the boundaries of the human body, in, through, or underneath the skin. Insertables are characterized by agency and choice and are therefore generally used for non-medical purposes, as opposed to implantable medical devices, which are inserted into the body for restorative purposes and are generally not optional. Many of these IMDs started as luggable devices, bought to the patient, becoming wearable with technological advancements, and then fully insertable, for example, the pacemaker. And we see this trajectory in many other health devices. <clears throat> and we are now seeing insertable forms of non-life-threatening health and more well-being products. For example, contraceptives exist uh, for females in a range of different modes, uh, including insertable. As do menstrual aids. Um, this usually makes people really awkward, but the next talk's about vaginas, so I'm so <laughs> <laughs> Uh, menstrual aids have wearable or insertable counterparts, and a woman can choose whichever she's more comfortable with. Even incontinence aids now have wearable diapers or a new insertable form for women. And recently, insertable products are becoming insertable devices by being incorporated with sensors or other digital interactions. Uh, so this is microchips, an RFID contraceptive currently in development with MIT, um, with the goal being that a woman can turn on and off her contraceptive in between uh, pregnancies. We also have the kick-started loon cup, the Internet of Things smart menstrual cup, and baby pod, insertable speakers to play music for your unborn baby. So these are real available devices that obviously have some consumer market. But it's not all for the vagina. Uh, there's an Internet of Things smart rectal thermometer, and uh, this is the North Star implant by Grindhouse Wetware. Uh, wetware because it goes in your body, it's not software, it's not hardware. Uh, and now while this is mainly more cosmetic, it is turned on and off by a smartphone. So it's sending um, digital signals through the human body. The use of insertables has been seen for decades in pop culture, uh, particularly science fiction. From the Cybermen of Doctor Who to the Terminator, the Six Million Dollar Man, and The Bionic Woman. There's a plethora of cyberpunk films characterized by near-future high-tech realities, uh, where humans are rebuilt with bionic implants to restore and even extend human capabilities into the superhuman. The microchipping trope has accented um, science fiction. Neo Jackson in The Matrix, James Bond's health is monitored and communicated via a chip, Quaid is implanted with a tracking chip in Total Recall, and even the T-Rex in Jurassic World realises she has a tracking microchip and bites it out. The list goes on. While microchip tracking is not technically possible, the government is not tracking you with hidden microchips, uh, the concept of insertables is no longer just contained to science fiction. Academic musings have been around since 1967, with Dr. Alan Weston speaking of the possibility of permanent emplacements of tagging devices in or on the body. And this sentiment has been echoed many times. It's not a big jump to say, OK, you have a wearable. Why not just embed the device? XBT researcher Peter Cochran foretold of a day where chips are not just worn around the neck, but are actually implanted in a human skin. And from a purely rational point of view, it would make sense to implant a small chip under the skin rather than have it on a card that can easily be lost. Such discussion is no longer hypothetical. To give you a flying abridged history, we start with Professor Kevin Warwick's Cyborg 1.0 experiment in 1998. He inserted an RFID chip for a time box period to open his office doors and activate the lighting. In 2000, 
2001, Dr Richard Seelig self-inserted identification chips after seeing first responders to the Twin Towers writing their badge numbers on themselves for identification. In 2004, he received FDA approval for human insertion of these microchips, brand named Verichip. These were used to store medical and health information, come into the hospital unconscious and be scanned to know your medical history and allergies. Over its tenure, approximately 2,000 chips were inserted in humans and 900 hospitals equipped to read them. Very chips were also reappropriated for some notable purposes, including employers of the Mexico Attorney General's office using it for access to secure uh, locations, and 100 staff and patrons of the now defunct Barcelona Baja Beach Club VIP program for access and point of sale payments. These very chips, like microchips used in pets or livestock, have a biobond coating. And this means that they bind to the tissue so they don't move, but it also makes removal very in invasive, if not difficult, uh, if not impossible. The first hobbyist to insert an RFID chip was Amal Grafster in 2005, and he sourced non permanent chips without this coating so that they could be more easily removed. He now sells these chips online and has sold thousands of user, uh, units thus far and engendered the hobbyist wave that we're now seeing. So we know that people are inserting devices into their bodies, but what and why was not known at scale. So who uses insertables? Uh, we did 17 in-depth interviews. Uh, they were mostly male with only three identifying as female with ages ranging from 18 to mid-40s. Participants were from Australia, New Zealand, and the United States. And while their technical and digital literacy did vary, many of them worked in highly technical fields. Our participants had a total of 47 devices currently within their bodies, not including those that had been removed or replaced for upgrades. Participants had magnets used for interacting with electronic and digital objects, NFC and RFID microchips for authentication and authorization, access, storing information and temperature readings, and bespoke devices for experimentation. So the RFID and NFC microchips are about the size of a grain of rice. They're inserted using a large gauge syringe like those used in body piercings or pet microchipping. And once inserted, they're invisible to the naked eye. This person doesn't even have a scar. Similarly, magnets are millimetres small. Sorry, I've used an Australian coin, not the best for scale, but teeny tiny. Uh, and they're generally inserted using a scalpel and are also invisible uh, once healed. I'm pretty sure that's the finger it was in, but you know, it could be the other one. You can't even tell the difference between those fingers. You can read more about how these are inserted, where they're inserted, where they get the chips from in our paper. The insertion position is generally selected based on use with form following function. So the standard position for a microchip is in the webbing of the hand. It's away from vital tissue. It's quite protected because it's quite squishy. And it also enables uh, natural interactions with sensors or with a foam. Only two participants deviated from this standard position to using biofirm chips, which they placed in their forearms for ease of strapping a reader to it, because it's not necessarily going to work on your hand. Magnets were commonly positioned at nerve endings, usually in the fingertips, to pick up electromagnetic waves and create new sensations. Magnets in other locations were used to afford specific interactions. A magnet in the wrist that a wearable could be placed over to digitally interact with it, magnets in the tragus of the ear for audio sensations, and the lover's magnet configuration, used for couples to join hands on the back while holding. So instead of placing a device on the body when needed and taking it off again when no longer required, we are seeing people augment the body in a semi-permanent way with an insertable device. This augmentation is typically not visible to others, comparable to those who choose to use contact lenses rather than wear glasses. So what does the use of these devices mean for the future of HCI and UX? Well, insertables offer interesting possibilities for the quantified self movement. They stay out of the way during recreational activities, they're waterproof by nature, 
and they do not become uncomfortable with movement or chafing or sweat, unlike some wearables. Two participants were using insertables for body temperature readings, with one trying to set up his air conditioning to automatically adjust based on this reading rather than ambient temperature controls. Our participants have repurposed old technologies, NFC and RFID, for new input applications from within their bodies. The lack of a suitable ecosystem for insertable devices remains an ongoing challenge. NFC and RFID are not currently widespread input options, often requiring additional peripherals or making of specialised devices to receive input. Our participants have gone through some effort to modify systems to accept their insertables as valid input. If these formats were more popular input technologies, as we're seeing there in the Android phone and they're now in the new, newest Windows phones, users can access systems more readily. This includes home access, work access and car access, replacing luggable keys, wearable dongles with insertables. It may seem trivial, but never being able to forget your keys certainly has benefits for some. You can never get locked out. You never have to call a locksmith or try and crawl, crawl through the cat flap. You never have to leave work because your child has locked themselves out. As one participant put it, I was super duper thankful that I went through this small tiny piece of pain for the guarantee that my key would always be with me as long as I've had my hand, which I've never ever forgotten. It only takes one or two times of making a trip that's already too long and having to drive the whole way back or deal with it for the whole day to make you realise a small pinch and this is solved? Yeah, give me the pinch. Many of our participants claim that insertables provided increased usability over existing solutions. Use of insertables as input to existing interfaces removed the need to stop and interact with devices, making them natural user interfaces with intuitive and seamless interactions. They were using them as input triggers to automatically and seamlessly launch other applications um, without interacting with the device. Just like wearables, interactions with insertables are efficient as users do not have to carry a device nor stop what they are doing to interact. For example, one participant set up the coordinates of his lab. It made everything easier. I didn't have to type in or interact with the interface. I just had to run my hand over my phone and I was on my way. Our participants expressed frustration with managing wearables. They no longer wanted to be bothered by carrying or wearing objects they f could forget and that they had to manage, recharge, put on, take off. Some found wearables uncomfortable and others didn't even wear their wedding rings. Participants had eliminated keys, dongles and external devices by relegating these input and storage functions to insertables. Our participants opted into insertables. For them, the benefits outweighed any pain or discomfort. They didn't want to manage keys, wallets, purses and phones, manage glasses, put wearables on and off, <coughs> Um, they tried to minimise the number of things they worry about in the day. One participant referred to this as the Tamagotchi effect. It is true, however, that not everyone is going to be satisfied with inserting a device into their body. Gluing RFID tags onto the nails, as you may have seen Karcher's yesterday at the uh, Body Beauty Tech booth, is far less controversial and threatening for the wider populace. Wearable and insertable devices can coexist with one another, just as wearable and insertable forms of the menstrual aids and the contraceptives exist, with users being able to choose whichever they are more comfortable with and whatever meets their needs. As devices are miniaturised, they are integrated into our everyday experience. They become a part of us. In this era of ubiquitous computing, there is a blurring of the line between technology and ourselves. And this line becomes even blurrier when the technology is physically inside us. Participants spoke of the impermanent permanence of insertables. They can be removed, but they cannot be forgotten. They wanted devices that became a part of them. Some for convenience, others not satisfied with a purely biological body and saw this as the next stage of human evolution and what was available at the moment rather than science fiction. Clearly, insertable devices are ubiquitous, small and unobstructed, comfortable to the um, point that they forget their existence. 
Participants associated the capabilities of the device with themselves. They spoke of their abilities as I can rather than attributing to the device. Participants took their capabilities for granted as they became the new norm and often said, it's weird that I can't unlock my door with my left hand or forgetting that other people couldn't do this. Some participants have also begun experimenting with insertables to receive data in a hands-free manner without having to stop what they are doing. Two participants were experimenting with the use of insertables for more than just a haptic notification that another device needs your attention, but actually transmitting the data itself. One application was a depth center, transmitting from a wearable over the magnet of the proximity of objects. They were able to walk around the room successfully with their eyes closed, a proof of concept to replace sensors in the blind. Leveraging insertable devices in this manner can be used to achieve a truly hands-free, eyes-free information receipt for individuals with and without impairments. While some were using it for sensory, ex uh, while others were using it for sensory extension, taking them beyond what humans can naturally do. Many participants using magnetic magnets were doing it to feel electromagnetic magnetic waves and add a new sense. Two participants used their Trago magnets along with a wearable coil to create <coughs> and transmit sound waves that the magnets then picked up, essentially making invisible headphones that sounds like it's coming from inside your head rather than through your ears while keeping your ears open for any um, external noise that may be happening. Now the aim for this wasn't just music, the pioneer of this configuration is losing his sight and wanted to augment by replacing that sense with echolocation. Using insertables for sensory improvement offers new modalities. So the body's roughly two square metres of skin is a canvas for devices. The insides of the body are no longer just limited to implantable medical devices as some individuals have begun to experiment using the 66 internal leaders as a platform for insertable devices. As acceptance grows, insertables may become a device mode of choice for future new ease. Thank you. <laughs> Hi there. Um, this is Paul Stromer from Queen's, uh, well, I used to be Queen's now, uh, Copenhagen University. Thanks for doing this. I really enjoy this. Um, so now we've kind of identified there's this area and there's people doing things that are new to many of us. Yes. Um, what can we as a research community learn from this? And how can we as a research community help this community in doing things? Like, what are the next three, three things we need to do to make their stuff cooler yeah. or to invite them into our community? Yeah. Um, thanks, that's a great question. Um, they somewhat don't want to be a part of our community because we're too slow and fuddy-duddy for them, uh, which was a quote from one of my participants. Um, <clears throat> but there are obviously things like it's quite hard to um, program them at the moment and this is why it's mainly technical people doing this. So. There are definitely solutions that we could develop um, to make it easier, which would uh, open this up to more people to be able to use. Um, it's also, you know, it's an invisible interface, so we're working with UX and HCI without a single pixel, um, which is new for me, but really interesting challenges. Um, so I think we can definitely learn about, yeah, the best UI is no UI from this. So, so is there a list paper you might want to see next year? <laughs> yes. Um, so what we're doing next is um, meeting the people who make these insertables and kind of trying to find out how they do it and, um, <clears throat> I guess, come up with principles of design for these type of things. So, yes. Sorry. Um, in order to keep it yeah. Um, yeah, I'll be around after if you want to chat and ask questions. Thank you. <laughs>